complete the stress response cycle. The process of dealing with stress is different from dealing with stressors, the things that cause your stress. To effectively eliminate stress, you need to complete the cycle. So, what is the difference between stress and stressors? Stressors are what triggers the stress response in your body. Stressors can be anything you taste, touch, smell, hear, see, or even imagine. There are external stressors such as cultural norms and expectations, time, family, money, work, experiences of discrimination, and many more. Examples of internal stressors are, memories, identity, body image, self-criticism, and the future. All these may be interpreted by the human body as threats. Stress is a physiological and neurological shift that occurs when your body encounters one of these threats. It is an evolutionary response that helped our ancestors cope with being chased by a hippo or a lion. Dread is anxiety on steroids. When information is relayed to the brain about an advancing lion or hippo, it auto-activate a generic stress response, which is a cascade of neurological and hormonal activity that triggers physiological changes that helps you survive. For vertebrates, our stress response is built around empowering the muscles to work like crazy. When being charged at by a lion, what do you do? Run. And then? There are two possibilities, you survive, or you shout for help, and the lion is killed by the villagers. The village then shares a communal feast, and inedible parts are buried. Stress response complete. Because the stressor has been dealt with does not mean you have eliminated the stress itself. Suppose as the lion charges, coming right at you, and your glycogen and cortisol shoot right through the roof, you pick up a rifle and shoot the lion. It drops dead, you are safe, then what? Your body still stuck in the middle of the stress response, telling yourself to calm down does not help, you need to signal to your body that you are safe, otherwise, your hormones and neurochemicals will not come back to a relaxed state. But why do we get stuck at this state? The following are reasons the cycle might not complete. 1. Chronic stressors, during emergencies, your brain activates a flight or fight stress response, you execute it, and it doesn't change the situation. 2. Social appropriateness, sometimes the stress response is something you can't do. 3. It's safer, during street harassment, it might be difficult to find a situation that deals with both the situation and the stress it causes. Walking away may be nice and the easy way out, but it does not deal with the stress itself. To complete the cycle efficiently, when you are being chased by a hippo, what do you do? Run. Swim. Or sing and dance to Beyonce and sweat it out as if you are in a Zumba class. Do anything that moves your body and allows you to breathe deeply. Managing the stressors and knowing when to call it quits. This chapter is about managing the stressors. It's about knowing how to persist when the limit of your capabilities has been exceeded. It's about knowing when to call it quits. It is about the monitor, a brain functionality responsible for managing the gap between where we are and where we are going. The monitor is called the discrepancy reducing, increasing feedback loop and criterion velocity. Many people tend to shut down after they hear this, so it is simply called the monitor. It is a brain mechanism that decides whether to give up or keep trying. It is aware of your goals, the effort you have invested in that goal, and the progress you are making. The monitor documents your effort to progress ratio and has significant input into what that ratio should be. With a good understanding of how the monitor works, you will be able to influence your brain's functioning, which will give you the ability to deal with both controllable and uncontrollable stressors. Planful problem solving, a way to deal with stressors you can control when efforts fail at producing desired results, you can change the type of effort you invest. For instance, if you are stuck in traffic, you can use a GPS to find a new route to go around it. This strategy is planful problem solving. Positive reappraisal, a way to deal with stressors you can't control. Imagine you are stuck in traffic as above, and your GPS is faulty. In a situation like this, turn to the positive reappraisal strategy. The strategy involves recognizing being stuck in traffic is a value. It is coming to the realization that the discomfort, effort, and frustration have value. It should be seen as opportunities for growth and learning. Positive reappraisal and planful problem solving are evidence-based strategies to change the effort invested in attaining a goal. They will help reduce your frustration by motivating you and driving you forward. But then we get exhausted and we wonder if we can accomplish any of the things we hope for, without destroying ourselves in the process. We ask ourselves if it's time to quit. 
Redefine failing for impossible, abstract or intangible goals, you can reduce frustration by developing a non-standard relationship with winning. At times, you aim for a clear and concrete goal that cannot be redefined. For this type of goals, you need a non-standard relationship with failing. It is possible to do all the things required to achieve a goal, only to end up somewhere different but pretty amazing. As a character in Dirk Gently, Douglas Adams's puts it, I seldom end up where I intend to go, but often I end up somewhere that I needed to be. If you widen your horizon to see the inadvertent benefits along your way, it becomes almost impossible to fail, since the strategy acknowledges there is more to success than winning. When to give up you may find yourself oscillating between persistence or giving up. A rational way to decide is to write the following four lists, what are the benefits of continuing? What are the benefits of stopping? What are the costs of continuing? What are the costs of stopping? Make a decision based on your estimates of how to maximize benefit and reduce cost. Always factor the short-term and long-term costs and benefits. If you decide to persist, include completing the cycle in your plan. How to find meaning in life? Science has shown that meaning in life is good for us, just the way sleep and exercise is good for us. This chapter is about meaning, as a strong life force, something you carry that helps you resist and recover from burnout. A man's need for meaning in life is the same as that of a woman but fundamentally different in terms of obstacles women face and their sense of meaning. Orgasms, art, and meaning in life are different from every other thing in life, everyone experiences them differently from every other thing when encountered, and no two experiences are exactly the same. Research has approached meaning in two ways. According to Martin Seligman, meaning is one of the vital elements of life that promote happiness in healthy people. In another research, meaning is a strategy used by people who are recovering from trauma or illness. These differing views have four things in common meaning is not fun. Meaning offers a positive final value that an individual's life can exhibit. Meaning is not constant. Meaning is good for you. Furthermore, research has shown that meaning is likely to come from the following three sources, the pursuit and attainment of ambitious goals that an individual leave as a legacy such as making the world a better place for kids or finding a cure for HIV, service to a divine or spiritual calling such as glorifying God with my words, thoughts, and deeds. Emotional and loving intimate connection with others. There is no wrong or right source of meaning, it is anything that triggers the feeling that your life has a positive impact. Human giver syndrome is a virus whose goal is to perpetuate its own existence. As soon as you were born, you become infected. Just as bovine spongiform encephalopath Y makes cows mad, and rabies virus makes dogs aggressive, the human giver syndrome alters human behavior to perpetuate itself. The symptoms of human giver syndrome are, the feeling you have a moral obligation, that you owe it to the world, your family, partner, or even to yourself to be attentive, generous, calm, happy and pretty the needs of others. Feeling that you're a failure means you deserve to be punished, and you might actually beat yourself up believing the two above are not symptoms but regular and authentic ideas. These symptoms are self-masking, which makes this metaphorical virus a successful infectious agent. Everyone around you is also infected, so, everyone treats the human giver syndrome as normal human behavior, this reinforces your belief that it is a healthy and a normal way to live. Patriarchy blindness causes compassion fatigue. In the wake of violence, the priority is stopping the bleeding and trying to save the victim's life. After stabilizing the victim, the priority will shift to figuring out how the bleeding started in the first place, this is the point we talk about the knife and those who use it. Learned helplessness is the inability to try. Humans who repeatedly find themselves in unfavorable situations from which escape is impossible may give up trying even when the opportunity for escape arises. When an individual suffers from learned helplessness, its mental state shift from frustration to the pit of despair. It is not a rational choice. Instead, their central nervous system was programmed such that when they suffer, there is little or nothing that can be done to make a difference. The animal has learned it is helpless, and the only route for self-preservation is not to try. We are not our own enemy, neither are the other people. The real enemy is the game itself, which convinces us that it is not the enemy. Patriarchy blindness number one. Human giver syndrome in the core of the human giver syndrome lies in spoken, deeply buried assumption that women should give everything, should dedicate every moment of their lives to the care of others. Self-care is selfish because it is only concerned with promoting a giver's well-being while ignoring someone else. 
The human giver syndrome is the framework on which sexual violence hangs. The notion that men are entitled to women's bodies, and that if a woman looks attractive enough or put herself in a position where her body can be taken control of, well, men have the right to take what they can. Unfortunately, this is still a legally sanctioned reality. The human giver syndrome is deeply ingrained, and it takes a look at statistics to reveal the injustices and imbalances meted to women. Human givers don't control or own anything, not even their bodies, they are harassed, assaulted, and abused by a man. Victims of sexual assault get death threats and are often accused of bringing the act on themselves. The solution to this problem is to raise everyone to be human beings. Human giver syndrome constrains our ability to view gender based imbalances, inequalities, and injustices, it blinds us to the patriarchy. Patriarchy blindness number two. Headwinds tailwinds asymmetry people always notice their adversarial headwinds and ignore their helpful tailwinds. It happens in all kinds of people, and all kinds of situations. Research has shown that people believe their favorite sports team goes into a game with a lot more disadvantages than the other team. Some even reported that their parents were easier on their siblings than in themselves. In many ways, many people ignore the advantages they have benefited but remember the obstacles they have overcome. This is because the obstacles often require more energy and effort than the easy parts. This is not the same as being a jerk. A jerk complains of being unfairly treated when in actual fact, they are being treated fairly rather than being given preferential treatment. Most of the time, men often insist that women don't have it harder than men. This assertion shows they are expressing headwinds tailwinds asymmetry. The bikini industrial complex BIC profit by setting an unachievable aspirational ideal for us. This is the name given to the hundred billion dollar industry that profit by setting unachievable aspirational ideal for us. It tries to convince you and everyone to conform to a set of ineffective but plausible strategies to achieve this idea. It is similar to an old cat pee in the carpet, it is pervasive and disturbing every day, but invisible, such that no one can remember when it did not smell. Let's spend the next few paragraphs deciphering where the smell is coming from. The media is filled with products that want to sell you thinness from the shellac abs in ads for exercise equipment to the one proven trick to lose belly fat completely, clickbait. And when you need to listen to a weather forecast, it is being anchored by a flawless thin women on TV. The BIC, another name for the bikini industrial complex, has created a culture of immense pressure to conform to an available idea. This idea is not only being framed as most beautiful but the virtuous and healthiest. But this is not true. You can be healthier when you are 60 or more pounds above your medically defined optimal weight than when you are 5 pounds under it. According to a 2016 meta-analysis published in The Lancet, involving 189 studies which examined about 4 million people who are non-smokers with no diagnosed medical issues. The result shows that people classified as obese by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention CDC, had a lower health risk compared to those classified as underweight. In another study, people classified as overweight in the BMI category may live longer than others in any other group, and the highest predictable rate of mortality was found among the underweight. The body mass index, BMI is a nonsense measure of one's personal health. It is simply the ratio of one's height to weight. Relax. Your belly is supposed to be round. The BIC has been gaslighting you. The companies that make up the BIC are not out to get you, but they have made up a screwed up system on purpose because there is money to be made by establishing impossible standards to measure ourselves. Social connection create energy. Social connection is an example of nourishment like fruits. Similar to how one's early experiences shape the present day relationship with food, early experiences of connection influence our present day relationships with other people. The specific nutritional needs change throughout a lifetime, but the fundamental need for food does not. Similarly, the need for connection changes over time, but our fundamental need for connection does not. Also, the 21st century culture constrains our choices of food, same goes for connection. As a baby, being alone is not just a function of being lonely, it is a matter of life and death. This is not because babies need to be fed or kept warm, it is because babies can die of loneliness even if other needs are met. Coming in contact with another person is a fundamental biological need, and being lonely is a form of starvation. 
as adults, connection physiologically nourishes us, regulating respiration rates and heart rates, shifting our immune response to wounds and injuries, influencing the emotional activation in our brains, and modulating our stress response. We will literally become sick and die without connection. A study in 2015 showed that loneliness and social isolation increased a person's odds of death by 25 to 30 percent. In the beating heart of every individual is that infant who can't survive without connecting with other people. But the human giver syndrome says this path is not for everyone. Imagine a baby boy who learns to talk, walk, feed himself and control when to pee or poop, he learns to count and read, and do physics, he stopped wanting to be held by his mommy and then leaves home to be independent, at this point, he is a full-fledged human being. On the other hand, is the baby girl who is supposed to grow independent, but then the next step is marriage and babies, and she becomes a full-fledged human giver. Wanting to be grounded in autonomy is seen as masculine, superior, and stronger. And an identity grounded in connection is considered feminine, inferior, and weak. It is generally believed that healthy people should feel 100% whole without a romantic partner, nor the support of a family or community. The social connection should be considered a bonus, and not an essential component of well-being. This is far from the truth. No one is complete without others. To live without social connection is to be nourished without food. It is impossible. You will get hungry, you will become lonely. You must feed yourself, or you die. This is not about getting a man or romantic partner, you need connection, any of its varied forms. You need both connection and autonomy, more importantly, the ability to oscillate from connection to autonomy and back again. What makes you stronger is rest. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You have been hearing this for years, but is it true? For instance, if you got hit by a car and didn't die, do you become stronger? No. Do disease and injury make you stronger? No. These things leave you vulnerable to further injury. In a real sense, what makes you stronger is what happens after you survive what didn't kill you. Rest is what makes you stronger. It is simply the process where you stop using that part of you that is inflamed, damaged, worn out, or used up. This allows it to renew itself. Rest does not necessarily mean sleep, of course, sleep is important. Rest also means switching from one type of activity to another. The idea that you can use self-control to stay productive every minute of the day is incorrect, it is gaslighting, which will potentially damage your brain. Humans are configured to oscillate between rest and work when you allow this oscillation to run its course, the quality of your work will improve, along with your health. Taking a rest after a depleting task help eliminate the effect of fatigue. When you stop a mental sapping activity and switch to neutral mode, your brain at this state is not doing anything. In fact, there is little difference between the amount of energy used up when in the middle of a task, and when you sit on a chair, mind wandering. What runs in the background of your awareness is what neuroscientists call the default mode network. It is an intricate connection of linked brain areas that act as a kind of low-grade dreaming when you are not focused on a task. Mental rest is not idleness, it is the time your mind process the world. An unused muscle will atrophy. A muscle that is not always worked will become fatigued and will eventually fall in exhaustion. A muscle that gets worked and rested will grow stronger. Bodies are imperfect, and sometimes they let us down. They are susceptible to disease and breakage and entropy. Our bodies can disappoint us, and the world can punish us when our bodies aren't what they should be. So we are not suggesting that you love your body, like that's an easy fix. We're suggesting you be patient with your body and with your feelings about your body. Sleep is strange. Humans spend one-third of their lives in this vulnerable state, eight hours a day, every single day. How does it make sense? During sleep, it turns out that the social, emotional, cognitive, and physiological benefit of being unconscious eight hours a day outweigh the costs in time and the opportunity to do other things. During the sleep process, the whole body, primarily the brain works hard to accomplish life-preserving tasks. Such tasks are best achieved when you are not active to interfere with it. In summary, we are not complete without sleep. Sleep deprivation wears us out. But how much is adequate? Science says 42%. This is the amount of time your body, especially the brain needs to spend resting. This translates to 10 hours out of every 24. It might not be every day, you can average it over a week, a month or more. If you don't take 42%, 42% will take you. Grow mighty by controlling your madwoman.
In Amy Poehler's memoir Yes, Please, she describes the pestering internal voice that regularly tells her she is appalled and doesn't deserve love. Women experiencing human giver syndrome will likely know this inward madwoman. It is responsible for that harsh self-criticism of the gap between you and the expected you, telling you it's your fault and a sign that you are a failure in life. Benevolent self-analysis can help you become more meticulous, as well as, easily prevent you from doing anything. The madwoman is a stickler, she can persuade you to surrender when your primary misstep shows up, or keep you from even trying at all since your flawlessness is incomprehensible. In any case, to become forceful and solid, you should take risks and do not hesitate to learn from your slip-ups. You have to control your madwoman. And the best technique to do this is to have a clear picture of your madwoman. The more you understand what she is, the better your capacity to separate yourself from her dangerous voice and stop hearing her reprimands. This can even trigger an amicable relationship that helps you become your best. When you have the madwoman's voice leveled out, it becomes easy to practice self-empathy, which will help you become more grounded. Self-compassion is a complicated process since it is basically a type of mending. When mending whether it is it a broken arm or association with ourselves, it brings agony and weakness. But if you can persist, the mending will be complete, and you will become mightier and more grounded for having endured. Self-compassion and gratitude will help you understand the difference between what you are and what the world wants you to be without beating yourself up over it. You do not have to wait for the world to change before you heal yourself and everyone around. Conclusion That you have eliminated the stressors does not mean you have dealt with the stress. You do not need to wait till all your stressors are dealt with before you deal with your stress. Which simply mean, you do not need to wait for the world to be better, before making your life better. When you make your life better, the world becomes better. Try this. The cure for burnout is not self-care, it is everyone caring for the other person. So, trust your body, be kind to you, remember you are enough, and your joy matters. Lastly, tell everyone you know about this.